I'm very happy to be following uh, Jay Snelson because he basically provided a lot of the theoretical uh, underpinnings for what I'm going to be talking about today, so I don't have to talk about any of that. Um, over the last couple of days, if you've, been, if you've attended any of the events over at the Parallel Co Convention Hollywood Expo, could you raise your hands, please? Very few, okay. Good, that gives me a good basis to start. Barbara Billingsley died this morning. How many of you know who she is? Okay. Good, that's a lot of you. Barbara Billingsley played June Cleaver on Leave it to Beaver from the uh, late 1950s to the early 1960s, about six seasons. And you'll all remember her as the lady who could speak jive in the movie Airplane. <laughs> now the reason why I start with Barbara Billingsley is because she is an icon over at the other convention, Hollywood Expo. Sky Douglas Conway put on two parallel conventions at the same time, one having to do with the ideas of freedom and liberty, and the other one, a convention about culture and cultural icons attended by people who are called fans, which is short for fanatics. Murray Rothbard always talked about how what the libertarian movement needed was a passion for justice. And what is common between the two conventions is the word passion. Here we have passion for liberty, passion for freedom, and they have a passion for culture, for art. And my talk here today is titled Reloading the New American Revolution. Actually, that's redundant. If you're reloading it, it's not new. It's, should be reloading the American Revolution if we're not going to have a little bit of a, a grammat grammatical uh, uh, misplay there. But I could have called it, and I wanted to go positive rather than negative, I could have called it the Achilles heel of the freedom movement. <sighs> Show of hands, how many atheists do we have here today? Good, good number. Um, how many of you believe that the story of Moses leading the people, uh, uh, the, the, the Israelites out of Egypt, is myth or fiction? Show of hands. Good, another good number. Good. Because the more that you believe that this didn't happen, the more that you believe that it's fiction, the more that you believe that it's just a story, the more I can say to you, we are now talking about fiction as one of the great inspirations for freedom movements throughout human history ever since. Okay? happened again just prior to the uh, American War between the states. A book called Uncle Tom's Cabin became so popular, um, it became a, a battle cry for freedom. The story of Eliza on the ice, the image of this slave girl running away, was uh, so powerful it was used again in, uh, in uh, and Anna and the King of Siam, the king, uh, made into the musical The King and I. Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura on the original Star Trek, a series that was a ratings failure in the 1960s, ran, ran three seasons on NBC and was considered a ratings failure for all three seasons. She became an international cultural icon based on her appearance on that low-rated TV show. So much so that after the first year, she wanted to quit. She was over here. She, she gave a talk on this just, you know, w w at the Hollywood Expo, right here, okay? That you guys, most of you guys didn't, didn't, didn't see. Dr. Martin Luther King would not let her quit that series because he says that her appearance as that char character on a science fiction TV series which had low ratings was so important to the civil rights movement, he would not allow her to quit because he says, you allow people to see us as we are supposed to be seen. Dr. Martin Luther King who probably, arguably, maybe unarguably, was the head of the most successful revolutionary movement in the United States in the 20th century, the movement for black civil rights. He saw that the vision of this character on a low-rated network TV show was so important, he would not let her quit. She was ready to quit, go back to Paris, go back to her, her first love, which was musical theater and singing. He would not let her quit, talked her out of it. The Achilles heel of the libertarian movement 
is that all of you understand the ideas of freedom, but the general public does not. The ideas that Jay Snelson was talking about, the win-win theory as opposed to the win-lose theory, they're learning the win-lose theory from Gordon Gecko in Wall Street. That character, Gordon Gecko, first in Oliver Stone's Wall Street, now in, uh, now in the sequel. It is Gordon Gecko who sells the idea, we win, they lose. He's the one who's selling the zero-sum game with winners and losers. That is part of pop culture. That, it's not just in school, not just in colleges, it's in movies and TV shows. Pop culture, where people are getting their ideas on economics and politics. How many of you saw the movie Runaway Jury? It was a, um, uh, it was a novel first by John Grisham in which the bad guys were the tobacco companies, uh, and then it was changed to gun manufacturers for the movie. The advisor to the production of the movie was the legal advisor of the Brady campaign. The, you, can, uh, you can look at the, uh, at the end credits of the movie and you'll see that their legal advisor for that movie, which is about a courtroom drama, came from the Brady campaign, uh, which is an anti-gun organization to, to remove uh, the right to keep and bear arms. Which, by the way, the founders of the American Revolution considered the one thing that the American people had, uh, had going for them as a chance to maintain their freedom over the centuries was the fact that they, he wanted them to be better armed than the government. Okay? He, they considered that the guarantor of the, of, of the freedoms of the American people was their right to keep and bear arms. And yet, popular culture, gun manufacturers are evil. Okay? How many of you saw the movie Avatar? Unobtainium, we are here because of this little rock, and because of this little rock, we have the right to slaughter all of these gorgeous, uh, gorgeous blue people, okay? That is the most successful movie of all time. It's done over $2 billion worth of box office, and that doesn't even count Blu-ray and DVD, and they haven't even come out with the 3D Blu-ray yet, okay? It's already gone over $2 billion. The most successful movie of all time basically tells us that capitalism is the problem. There is no vision in that movie of, uh, of, of free enterprise being a bulwark of freedom. It is the enemy of freedom. Okay? It, is, it is the philosophy of, con uh, of conquest, of mass murder, of destroying the tree of life. Capitalism is the enemy in the most successful movie of all time. This morning, as I was getting ready to come down here today, they had on HBO, Alvin and the Chipmunks, the Squeakquel. This is the second movie, the first one with Alvin and the Chipmunks. Both movies have as their villain a business manager, a talent manager, who's trying to basically, literally, enslave the talent, put them in cages, and make them slaves. This is going out to, the, to our children. They're being taught right from the beginning in beautifully gorgeous entertainment who the enemy is. The enemy is businessmen. Okay? What chance do we as libertarians have against messages like that in pop culture trying to, trying to get out to them? Jay Snelson's ideas, okay? Galambos before him, Ludwig von Mises, Hazlitt, Hayek. These are people who we know because we know them through the intellect. Murray Rothbard, we know through the intellect. Okay? But I came to the libertarian movement through the works of Robert Heinlein, okay? a science fiction writer. It was the images uh, of revolution, of future revolution, in his stories, in his tales, in his parables, that brought me to you today and turned me into a carnival barker for Jay Snelson. Because he's the bearded lady, I'm the carnival barker to rope, to, to rope in the rubes, okay? Pop culture is the way that ideas are propagated, and the libertarian movement has funded think tanks, educational institutions, economics departments, journalists, historians, economists, but it has totally fallen down on the job of competing in the realm where ideas reach the general public pop culture, entertainment, comedy, movies, television, 
sitcoms, reality TV. Okay? This is how the general public, they learn about win-win or win-lose. This is, this is where they're, they're learning it. You think that they're getting it from the schools? The schools can't teach the other side's ideas any better than they can teach our ideas. They're getting it from pop culture. That's where the battleground is. The battleground is ballroom B, not ballroom D. Okay? And Sky Douglas Conway put them as close together as anybody has ever done before. But it needs to come from here and here to here. This is the victory. I've been in the business of libertarian pop culture since my first novel came out in 1979, Alongside Night. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. I want to talk first off about a few other things, about a few other authors who, if you don't know about, you should know about. Out there, you have Big Head Press, which is Scott Beezer and L. Neal Smith working together to put together pop culture ideas. We had in here yesterday a film called American Dream, a 30-minute animated feature through beautiful animation and trenchant satire, teaching about the idea of, of fiat money. Out there, there's a table. Unfortunately, Posh, I, I was hoping Pasha Robert, uh, Roberts would be in here. He had to catch uh, a, a flight. But the table was there, out there, for the last two days for his upcoming animated feature, Silver Circle. Okay. We are your warriors. We're your champions. By the way, people have often wondered why you have an L. Neal and a J. Neal. The translation of the name Neal means champion. Okay? We're your gladiators. Okay? We're going into the arena of pop culture up against Steven Spielberg and Oliver Stone. Okay? These guys, you know, they're big business. Okay? James Cameron, big business. And we're, I'm having trouble coming up with the $3.6 million needed to take a long side night the most successful libertarian parable since Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, and I say that with a little pride because in the last year, since June 13, 2009, we've had 234,000 downloads of the book off the internet. I consider that a success. I'm trying to take that, that book, and I want to put it on 4,000 movie screens in front of people who are the main demographic for buying movie tickets. The two leads of Alongside Night are 18 years old. Okay? John Galt isn't 18 years old. Dagny Tackard isn't 18 years old. Okay? Where, whichever demographic the, uh, the Atlas Shrugged movie is going to be reaching, okay, I think Alongside Night has a better chance because the protagonists of my story are the age of the people who are mostly buying the tickets. <laughs> maybe, not, maybe, not a, maybe not a literal vampire with teeth, but I do have a character who's the head of FEMA, and he's pretty vampiric. <laughs> I start out alongside Night the Novel, which came out in 1979, with a classroom discussion of hyperinflation. My lead character is Elliot Vreeland. Uh, I know we have uh, uh, David Friedman in the room here with us today. David, would you raise your hand so people can see where you are? Okay. Uh, David was an advisor for me on, uh, on this book. Uh, he disagrees with some of the things I did with it, but it's hard to agree with David on everything. He's so trenchant. <laughs> you know, David, David has more ideas in five minutes than most of us have in a lifetime. Uh, and he's a novelist himself now. But da David, um, uh, people have always thought that, uh, that David is sort of the model for Elliot Vreeland, being the son of a Nobel Prize winning economist. When I wrote the novel, uh, his dad hadn't won the Nobel Prize yet, okay? Uh, I, 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 or actually, when I started writing the novel, he hadn't won it yet. He, he won it in, uh, in, in 76, and I had my first uh, draft of the novel done by May 1st, 76. And uh, I think when David was first reading uh, the original chapters I was writing, uh, it was before his dad won the award. So Dr. Martin Vreeland, which sounds an awful lot like Milton Friedman, is not really Milton Friedman, but David's father, Milton, through the good offices of David sending him the manuscript, ended up endorsing the novel, which was a great help to an unpublished manuscript in finding, in finding a publisher. And then I had the, the, uh, the, the good graces of my publisher sending out the, the manuscript to Anthony Burgess, who also 
uh, endorsed it at the time when he was a superstar of literature coming off of A Clockwork Orange. So this first novel got a lot of attention. Got a rave review from the Los Angeles Times. Detroit News, you don't think of Detroit News as being a libertarian newspaper, and yet the, the reviewer of the Detroit News praised the story even though he said he disagreed with every idea I had in it. <laughs> and compared me to Randon Heinlein in his review. Okay? Um, Reason Magazine um, uh, uh, had, had it reviewed and, uh, and, and, gave, and gave it a great review. And over the years, people were always uh, comparing it uh, to Atlas Shrugged, which um, I'm sure pissed off Rand as much as it pissed me off. <laughs> not, not, not that I don't appreciate the comparison to Atlas, uh, Atlas Shrugged, but she has this, you know, this huge epic tome, you know, the Lord of the Rings of, uh, of libertarianism. And I have this skinny little book, which I always knew when I was writing it, you know, this would make a better movie than it makes a book. Because it's basically, you know, I, I, I don't have my, my golf speeches in it. I, you know, I basically have everything happen through the action. It's, you know, a tight, tight little adventure story. People have said it's more like a Heinlein Juvenile than anything else. But the point to Alongside Night is that when I was writing it and uh, finishing it in 76 and then going through a few more drafts, finally came out in uh, October 1979 was to project what would happen if things went on the way they looked like they were going even that far back, and farther back if you read Atlas Shrugged, which is what happens if the ideas of socialism and fascism uh, and, and Keynesian economics reach their culmination in the collapse of the dollar through hyperinflation, through government overspending, through overcontrol of the economy, the destruction of the engine of creation. And Lord, if the stuff that I put in that novel isn't happening now, which is one of the reasons there's been 234,000 downloads of this since June of, uh, of last year. But how do I get that message on 4,000 movie screens? Okay, well first I have to make the movie. Before we get to, to that, how many of you have been to the book table over there where I have my books, or to the table all the way back there where there's a book called Anarchia on sale, a novel about the Spanish-American Revolution uh, uh, pardon me? Uh, pardon me. This, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kent. Well, you know, I'm speaking off the cuff. I'm entitled to make a few mistakes. The Spanish, the Spanish Civil War, okay? Only in this case, in this alternate history, it's anarcho-capitalists rather than uh, anarcho-communists who were involved in the, uh, in the Spanish Civil War. And because of that, they managed to uh, uh, connect up a few characters like Hedy Lamar and Werner von Braun and uh, the super science of von Braun sort of helps the anarchists uh, uh, win that revolution. Okay? And so uh, when Hitler and, and, and Stalin come to, pow uh, you know, come to power in, in, in the world stage, they have a force to oppose them. Man, would, wouldn't that have been nice if that had happened? Um, Brad Lineweaver. Uh, somebody who's, who's now on the other, other coast uh, will, be, will be here for the Carl Hess Club in, uh, in December. He wrote a novel which pulled off an incredible feat. It has endorsements on it from Robert Heinlein, William F. Buckley Jr., the liberal one-worlder Isaac Asimov, okay, and Ray Bradbury. Talk about endorsements for a novel. How many of you have heard of Moon of, uh, Moon of Ice or read it? A few of you, not, not too many. These are, this is the ammunition of the libertarian movement in reaching the wider audience, okay? And yet, it's, it's, like we're, it's, it's like we're below the radar, we're invisible, okay? L. Neil Smith, The Probability Brooch, and, 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 and many sequels after that, created an entire vision of what society would be like. The, the ideas that Jay Snelson talks about, we, we have been putting them into action in our fiction for three, de three, three decades now. Okay, why isn't it up on the movie screens? Why don't the American people and, and, and people worldwide who are inspired by the American Revolution, why don't they have the images of our societies and our revolutions in front of them to compare to the other images, the images of Avatar and Runaway Jury and Alvin and the Squeak, Alvin and the Chipmunks, the Squeakquel, and the new Flintstones movie in which, uh, in, in which again, big business is again the bad guy. Okay, you know. I was on, on my Facebook page a few weeks ago. I said, you want to look like a genius to your friends? Watch any crime drama on TV 
and within the first 10 minutes, a businessman will be introduced as a character. I say, point to him and say, that's who did it. <laughs> and about 95% of the time, you'll be right, and everybody will think you're smarter than Sherlock Holmes and that you should be winning on Jeopardy. But it's, but it's a simple parlor trick, because in terms of Hollywood, we're the enemy. Why are we, we the enemy? Because we have a vision that they don't have, the vision that Jay Stelson was talking about of win-win. Okay? We don't believe that poor people have to become poorer for rich people to become richer. We believe that when rich people become richer, poor people become rich. And that's the way that our ideas have tested out in, in, in reality. But again, Jay said, read a history book. Good luck if you could find the history books even you know, outside this room that'll, that'll teach that. The way that you reach the mass audience is through telling stories, through, through making them into fanatics by exciting their passions for liberty. The passions that Murray Rothbard said were necessary for the libertarian movement to succeed. The passion for justice and the passion for liberty both require an understanding of the ideas of this room, but we have to put them in a form that the mass audience can understand because they're not going to get it through, uh, through news and they're not going to be getting it through reading newspapers and they're not going to be getting it in their classrooms. This is where the battlefield is. Alongside Knight has built up some fans over the years with some names. We, I, I already mentioned Milton Friedman and, uh, and Anthony Burgess. More recently, Ron Paul, who is, who is in, I think without a doubt, the figurehead, and I, I don't mean just figurehead, I mean literally the, the, the brains of the entire Tea Party movement. You know, it's not Sarah Palin, it's not, uh, uh, it's not Glenn Beck, it's Ron Paul. Okay, that's where this all started. The Tea Party was literally people who, after Ron Paul's uh, Republican bid uh, for, for the presidential nomination came to an end, said, what do we do now? And that became the Tea Party. Ron Paul says, alongside Knight, may be more important now than it was 30 years ago. Obviously, I agree with him, because now is when the battle has to be fought. Okay? We're on the crisis right now. The ideas which were science fiction 30 years ago are not science fiction anymore. Okay? Everybody was calling my book science fiction when it came out in 1979. It's not science fiction anymore, because we just saw it happen in Spain. The riots that, are, that I have in my novel, from economic collapse, from government overspending, Okay? But, you know, it wasn't science fiction when I wrote about it, because when I was writing about it, I was looking at her historical examples, like the hyperinflation of 1793, the French Revolution. I was looking at the hyperinflation of, um, of continentals during the American Revolution. I was looking at Weimar Germany in 1923. I had plenty of historical examples that nobody knew about. Okay? So I put it in the science fiction, and everybody says, oh, this is, you know, this, you know, Anthony Burgess said, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's America on the verge of revolution. Well, that's where we are today, America on the verge of revolution. Okay? The way that the Democratic Party, in their political ads, talks about uh, Tea Party candidates, like Sharon Engel in, uh, in my home state of Nevada, okay? because she's not a socialist, because she doesn't believe in the Department of Education, because she doesn't believe that Social Security actually is security, okay? they're calling her a dangerous radical. Too extreme to be trusted. Too extreme because you're not a socialist? That's, they've already won then. If, if extremism today is not being a socialist, then socialism is the mainstream. They have already won. And we are now fighting a revolution to get back what we had. That is the new American Revolution, or reloading the American Revolution, in whichever gra gramma grammatical form you want to put it in. Okay? But the battleground is popular culture. Now, we're in ballroom D. If you walk around 20 feet that way, you have ballroom B. Okay. I have behind me the, the, post, the movie poster for Alongside Night and the poster for the first movie I made, Lady Magdalene's. Lady Magdalene's, by the way, looks like it's standard cr uh, crime fare because you have uh, federal agents as the, as the action heroes of it. But isn't it strange that the, uh, the guy who wrote Alongside Night made this movie with federal agents as heroes? There's no contradiction. I, I haven't talked about it because there's plot spoilers involved in explaining that. Okay. <laughs> You've got to watch the movie to find out, wait a second, what is the, how, how did the guy who write Alongside Night write this with federal agents as the heroes? You've got to get to the last scene before you understand. 
okay? Because it's a secret. The whole point to, uh, to, uh, to suspense is that you pay it off with a surprise twist Twilight Zone ending. And yes, I wrote for the Twilight Zone, okay? So you've got Lady Magdalene's over there on uh, Jim Perrin's table in the back, uh, sitting alongside Alongside Night and my other books. Uh, and it, Jim didn't have enough space to, to get all of my books out. But the point is, see Jim Perrin before you leave here today. Pick up uh, some of my books. Uh, you've got uh, a couple of more that there wasn't display space for on the back table over there. Um, yeah, he was hold, holding, holding up the books over there. Anyway. This, these are, this is the ammunition for the cultural war which we're fighting right now, okay? Now, what's going to be happening at 1.30, which is uh, if you, you leave your lunch break a little early, you can get over there. I'm going to be there with the guy who is committed to play Dr. Martin Vreeland and alongside now the Nobel Prize winning Austrian school Mises quoting economist. Mises quoting in a movie, quoting Ludwig von Mises, okay? That is going to be played by Kevin Sorbo. You know him as Hercules on the TV series and then on Xena as well. He also uh, was on Andromeda, the t uh, science fiction TV series. Okay? He is committed to playing Dr. Martin Vreeland. Eric Avari, who uh, was here at the Hollywood Expo side for the last couple of days, unfortunately had a family crisis, couldn't be here today, was supposed to be on that panel also. He's going to be playing uh, Morris Gross, who leads Elliot Vreeland to the revolutionary agorist cadre, the underground free market economist. Okay? We've got Eric Avari to play that role. Okay? And I'm hoping to, uh, to get a certain actor. I mean, this is just, you know, don't write this down. Don't put this in the trades. It was recommended to Michael Serra by his agent for the role of Elliot Vreeland. I'm hoping to get Michael Serra, but that's not going to happen until I can offer his agent a start date, and that doesn't happen until I'm financed, and that comes to $3.6 million, which is the minimum budget to make this movie. I mean, it would be nicer to make it for $10 million, but we can make it for $3.6 million. And the minute I have $3.6 million in hand, I tell my line producer, Emmy, uh, Emmy Award winning line producer, Sasha Schneider, I say, get a casting director, let's set a start date. Okay, that's what happens. But we're going to be talking about Alongside Night. There's a panel, an Alongside Night panel, not here at Libertopia, but over at the Hollywood Expo side. Okay? Because Sky Douglas Conway has his hands in both worlds the passion of the fan, and the passion for justice and the passion for liberty over here at Libertopia. Sky is spreading out his wings and bringing us together for victory. Thank you very much. And I think I allowed us uh, a, a couple of minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, Rainbow Cadenza, I, 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 if, 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 God is, if God is with me, whether or not you believe that he's real, but if he's with me, um, I want to do Alongside Night. Then, because I can do it for about $13 million, I want to do the script based on my third novel, Escape from Heaven. And hopefully that will give me enough clout in the industry to do Rainbow Cadenza, which I think would probably have to be somewhere above $50 million to do it right. Yeah, I have to build up to that. But that's, yeah, that, you're looking into my, you know, my, my long-range goals. But first, you know, one project at a time. I made Lady Magdalene's here for half a million dollars. Okay? I'm hoping that's going to, uh, uh, you know, when we get up to you know, the $4 million range for Alongside Night, that I'll still be able to direct it. By the way, that's something Ayn Rand never did with Atlas Shrugged. She didn't teach herself to be a director so she could direct her own stuff. That's how you get the creative control that you want, is you teach yourself how to do the job. With this movie here, I taught myself how to be a screen director, uh, Kent Hastings and I taught ourselves how to do every job in post-production. We went through 14 cuts of the movie before we finally get to the one which is on DVD in the back there. Okay? 14 cuts over two and a half years okay, to teach ourselves how to take a movie which was totally underfunded for post-production. You, know, you look at the credits of a regular movie, you've got five people in the editing department and five people in the sound editing department and re-recording mixers and, and music editors and that sort of thing, and you've got basically 30 people to do what Kent and I did all by ourselves. Okay? Because we taught ourselves how to do each of those jobs. We learned the software. These posters that you're looking at here, I taught myself how to do the Photoshop to make them. Okay? I have songs which I wrote on the soundtrack, including the song sung by Nichelle Nichols, Rahab the Harlot, Okay? 
which by the way, uh, you know, I was watching on History Channel uh, about the conquest of Canaan, how bloody that was. It's like, you know, it's like Joshua the Barbarian, um, you, know, with, with, you know, with the swords and the slashing and the killing of every soul in sight and that sort of thing. Anyway, so we have Nichelle Nichols singing this great gospel song you know, which I was so honored that, that she sang, which I wrote. And I have also on the soundtrack uh, a, a sort of like an alternative Western ballad I wrote called Tried by Twelve, which is about a guy who's arrested for carrying a gun for self-defense. Okay, you know, I slipped so much propaganda in under the radar here that people don't even notice it, okay? But you gotta be looking out for it. It's there, trust me. You watch the, I think you have to watch the movie two or three times before you even start to catch all of it. Look for the fnord. I've got a fnord in here, okay? So, um, yes? No, 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 234,000 downloads. Yeah, we, we've had 234,000 people download and read the novel. No, that, that's all authorized downloads. That's all authorized downloads. We, we loaded the book up with display advertising for various different uh, libertarian products, you know, including uh, private marriage bureaus. So you, don't, so you don't have to go to the state to get, a, to get a marriage license. You can get it from a private marriage bureau. We have, in, uh, we have that in there. We have uh, uh, ver you know, uh, uh, ver various different uh, uh, you know, movie and TV projects, including uh, stuff from the Free to Choose Foundation. You remember that great Milton Friedman TV series uh, years ago, Free to Choose? Well, the guy who did that, he's still in business, Bob Chittister. And so uh, he had a documentary which they distributed called The Power of the Poor about the, um, uh, about the, the other way, uh, the other path in, uh, in Peru. By the way, uh, the other path, aside from this last stage where they basically went, went to legalization of everything through the government, is basically Samuel Edward Konkin's agorism being put into practice. Okay, the idea, what a long side night does, by the way, is it offers Sam Conkin's solution to how, to how to reach the libertarian society, not through the political means, but through the economic means, by using economics itself and the underground economy to create an underground economy law and order. When you can bring law and order to the black market, okay, capital will flow there. The reason why capital does not flow to the black market is because it's not safe. If you have dispute settlements, or there are ways to settle disputes in the black market, capital will flow there. That's what the theme of Alongside Night is. And Alongside Night, the movie, starts out with Elliot Vreeland in his classroom, giving a video presentation to the class called Economics in One Minute. Okay? You have the entire libertarian message of von Mises and the destruction of Keynes and everything like that within the first 10 minutes of the movie. Then we go on to the action adventure as he leaves his classroom.